vulnerable. Hey. What Sorry about type that. of dog do you have? A little miniature dachshund. Cute. And he's barking at a wall for some reason. <laughs> um, yeah, so I want to... You gonna stop talking, Chloe? You know, I'm... just <laughs> wants to be part of the conversation. <laughs> Hello, welcome to my podcast. To my Hello. Thanks for uh, having sorry. me. <laughs> yeah, I'm Joey Seuss, and be- I'm gonna pass my mic to um, Danny Jernigan. Yes. Um, in 2017, her whole world had turned upside down when she was randomly hit at the pedestrian at, on a sidewalk. Since then, she's living with chronic pain, nerve damage, PTSD, anxiety, depression, and fatigue. I'm so happy to have you. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm so happy to have you. Like I was mentioning before we started the podcast, that you have a very warm profile, Instagram profile, and just talking to you, I felt very warm for some reason. So I think this would be a great episode. Oh, good. That is definitely what I would like to give off. So that's encouraging to hear. Yeah, you're, you're doing uh, a great job. Thank you. So I, so I want to go on a topic, but before we go on that main topic, before you had your big accident, did you have any big accident before then? No. I had never experienced any car accident before. Um, I had been in a natural disaster at one stage, but excluding those two incidents, um, no near-death experiences before that really. Yeah, um, I was totally, I, totally healthy. Yeah, so I want to like talk to you about this topic. So I feel like like there's some like, things that everyone should experience once in their lifetime. And of course, I don't want them to be like hurt or like forever traumatized or, you know, chronic pain for the rest of their lives. Mm. But I feel like every person should always have like this really dark moment to like not only reflect on themselves, but like also see how strong they are and such, but also as a test for your family and friends because then you kind of see if they're, you know, who are really close to you and like who really care for you. And then the yeah. ones you can kind of, I guess, eliminate or, it, I mean, it's per person basis, but um, some, if you should not put energy in these people and such. So when you had your accident, well, so to question it, did you have that experience? Or do you agree with the statement that everyone should have a, a deep, dark moment? Um, I don't think they necessarily individually have to have one of those moments. My hope is that they can see my story or people like me and they can grow from that experience. I'm, I, I'm more of an optimistic person. I would never want, the reason why I post about my story is because I would never want someone to have to go through something like myself. But I do think there's benefit in learn, learning what I have learned through the process. So that's the benefit I think of sharing. But I get what you mean in terms of like people go through really hard things and you grow and you can learn a lot from it. But yeah, I definitely wouldn't wish anything bad on someone else. Um, But I do think there's value. Like you said, like, I think there is value in allowing yourself to experience things, not necessarily like a car accident or being something like intentionally putting yourself in a harmful position but if you are dealing with depression, anxiety, PTSD, any, any mental illness as well, allowing yourself to access those emotions and feelings, I think also has a really big benefit as long as you have support around you to build yourself back up. Um, Cause I think it helps you become a more rounded person and whole person. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, so I, I, I agree and disagree at the same time, I guess. So like, <laughs> Um, so besides all the symptoms I uh, listed, which is horrible, like whenever it was upon most people, but did your relationship with, how did your relationship change with yourself before the accident and then maybe like a year after the accident? 
I was. So before the accident, I was a dance teacher and a dance instructor, and I had moved from Canada to Australia for dance mostly. Um, and I studied some other things as well, but that's what kind of like moved me there. And my passion was dance. I was always very active, extroverted, loved the outdoors. Um, so the transition from being that type of a super active, involved person to having to help people bathe me and do everything, shopping, cooking, all that stuff for me. I went through a lot of like really not appreciating who I was, hating who I was, feeling very inadequate, unworthy, um, really went through like a dark, dark depression too of like, why do I exist now? Not so much that I lost dance. That was a big grieving part, which I still grieve. I think I probably always will like the freedom of movement and stuff that I once had, but I would say more the like, why am I pushing to survive through this if it's so painful? Because that right after the, the accident, that acute stage, so right after that accident, when I first got injured, they call that an acute stage in physio and all your rehab and stuff. It, everything is so painful because it's so heightened. Everything in your body, your nervous system, your memory, everything is very sensitive. So yeah, I remember going through a really dark stage of just being like, well, what am I going to do now? Why am I even bothering to fight through this? You know, every time I went through lots of relapses, which is for me looked like me going to a reha uh, rehab, which was physio and exercise physiologist, psychiatrist, physio uh, psychologist, all these people. But then physically, I kind of overdo it and then kind of be back where I started or are hardly above where I started so I think just learning like I went through a really really hard time of like frustration with myself what Not kind of con what kind of condition were you after the accident like so you weren't able to care for yourself at all so I right after the accident I wasn't I actually had some really good friends move in with me some already lived with me and some kind of just moved in to take care of me essentially um so I think they probably did that for the first couple months and then slowly I started being able to do stuff around the house um I didn't really cook, cook for myself probably for like a year or slightly over that I was on crutches for like eight months um so yeah it really depended on the day like someday I could some days I could do lots of things and then other days it would just be like a really bad flare up or whatever. I was also attending school at this time and I needed to keep that record of me attending for my student visa while I was doing rehab at the same time because I was in Australia and I'm Canadian. So yeah, I did, school was really the main focus and then I had really good friends around me to like help do all the other things and get me to appointments and I don't, I just took endless amount of Ubers and ate out so much and really was just in survival mode. Uh, I mean, you sound like you have really great friends to be able to do that. Yeah, they were amazing. I don't think, yeah, they're one in a million, I think for sure. Actually, um, two of my best friends who helped me recover ended up getting married. So that's how they met actually, uh, which really? is pretty, yeah. So that was, that was really special. Okay. Wow, um, so you're the so you have to like put them to marriage now. You have to be the um the what do you call it the the one that joins them. Yeah, well, they 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 got married about two years ago, but I got to be at their wedding, which was nice and oh, super that's special. So, that's cute. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but I would say there's of course trauma, like a trauma like that. Another thing about the accident that I probably haven't talked about as much is that a lot of the people in my school at the time witnessed me getting hit. And actually two of my other friends weren't as injured as bad, but they were in the accident with me as well. So I think it's, you have to have a lot of grace with people when it comes to trauma, I think, because everybody has all this internal things that we don't know how people are already processing, how they were raised, what they grew up with. And then if they watch something happen or experience something happen, it can be very confronting. So 
I did lose friends in the process, like just trying to set up boundaries that weren't healthy anymore, or naturally, you know, friends that I was friends with and because of dance, for an example, I wasn't dancing anymore. So those naturally fell away. But I also had to realize that like, even though it's my trauma, my experience, it's actually a collective, it was a very much a collective experience. So just because I was going to rehab and uh, physio and like doing my recovery journey doesn't mean that the people who witnessed me get hit were also doing the recovery journey, which means if they had any anxiety, PTSD, any of that from watching me be hit, that was immediately brought up whenever they saw me within themselves. So I definitely did have to put up some boundaries and lost some friends, but I have learned that there needs to be a big space of grace because some people just have a lot of stuff internally already going on and it's a lot to take on um, because I don't think we're really designed to handle that type of trauma. So yeah, it's a complicated thing, but I think grace is always really important. <laughs> self um, and others yeah you know that's a unique position for everyone to see you and you kind of i don't know if it helps you more or less if it was a collective experience that everyone was healing i'm assuming you got the worst of it with it terrible but like how yeah. did you get yourself out of like of the depression state i really had to take a lot of time to reflect on who I was as a person who I wanted to be and then also allowing I think the for me a big part was actually allowing to grieve who I used to be and who I used to see myself in the future how I used to envision myself for the future because you can be hopeful but for me I want to be hopeful and also realistic and the fact is that I was hit by a car. I do have injuries now. I have nerve damage in my leg. I do have chronic pain in these conditions that prevent me from doing what I had envisioned myself to do. So I actually probably for two years, maybe even slightly longer, like I was in a deep grieving process, which mm -hmm. can be very isolating because it's a kind of a foreign concept, but I... I don't even know where I, it probably was through counseling or something, but I just decided like, I need to grieve who I was and who I wanted to be because I will never be that person anymore be from that day forward. Like that day where I was hit always will change my life. And I never, of course, <laughs> nobody does. I never envisioned that in my, in my journey of life. So I think that was like, still is, I mean, I still grieve myself, my past self presently, mm -hmm. and it's almost been four years, but I think allowing myself kind of what I posted about today on Instagram that you commented, which is about, uh, it was about crying and your yeah. relationship with crying and your relationship with emotions and that emotions aren't bad or good. They are what they are. But I think allowing yourself to actually be in that space and find a safe space for yourself to dive into those things and grieve if you need to grieve. And, and for me, I'm not scared of it. I'm not scared of going into a dark place because I know my value and that I am worthy of being grieved. Cause there is a part of me that, like I said, it's, is essentially dead. Like I felt like there was a very clear line. This part of me has died and I need to mourn her so that this new person can become. So are you saying that you learn more about your mental self after the accident when you needed your time to grieve? And it also, it, did you have the, when you were grieving and like trying to get back to forming the new you, would you say it's more of a solo experience or do you have people around you that helped you too? I would say yes and no. I think... It was a collective experience because I did have really amazing friends, like I said, who moved in with me and that, and now even through Instagram, like I've made, like I met you through Instagram. I met so many people through Instagram who I think like in that way, collectively are growing and sharing together. But in those really dark, dark moments, I, I was just doing that pretty much all by myself. I mean, at one stage, 
I remember my friend just being like, you're not even here anymore. Like, I don't even know where you are. Like, it, it's like, I was really physically present, but like mentally, and I don't mm -hmm. even remember this. Like there's so many layers. Cause this is also like, obviously you're on medication and stuff like that. But, um, it was probably like six months after the accident. I remember her just crying, being like, I don't know where you are. Like, I know you don't want to be here. I know you want to give up and like, I don't know what to do to help you type situation. But so in that way, I remember like people trying to cheer me on and stuff like that. But in another way, I think you have to, when something like this happens, you have to be okay to be alone because at the, at the end of the day, like I'm the one who lives with these conditions. So it's still a foreign concept to other people, even though they can have compassion towards you and be like, oh yeah, that must be hard. But I'm the one whose life has completely changed. Mm -hmm. So I would say, yes, it was a experience of going like dark places together, but some of it, I just left them out of because it was very much me like trying to survive, trying to rebuild my mental state and like, sort those things out and also with rehab and counseling everything I was going through I don't even think I was aware of what was happening until maybe a year ago or something like there was just so much stuff happening that I think I was doing the work but not aware of what the work was because it was just like appointment 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 mm -hmm. so yeah it's I definitely think it's almost like a lifestyle. Like it, it's hard for me to separate those two things because on one hand it's very individual. And then on the other, I was living with a whole bunch of people. I had friends, I had people who, like I said, bathed me and nourished me back to health essentially. So it's like both and. How, how did it feel? I mean, maybe you don't remember it as much, but how did this feel to be like helped by other people? Like were you fully independent before and then now you have to ask everyone for help how, how did you feel about that I was very very independent before the accident um let me think about that for a minute so I can answer honestly yeah, I've been in a similar situation as you it's like I was fully independent for a long time and then um I did progress to a point where now I need help with everything and mm -hmm. I'm still having trouble like I literally need help with everything, but I still have trouble asking for help because mm -hmm. like you don't want to feel like needy, but totally. at the same time. So I, I want to get a, like, what is your perspective on it? Like, are you still okay with it now? Or are you still like, oh, I hate this, but. I initially, I think I was okay with it. It was very vulnerable. Like I was in a very vulnerable state physically and mentally. And in the beginning, it was okay because they didn't think my injuries were that bad, um, like lifelong injuries. But then as rehab like kept taking longer and longer and longer, and I was getting better, but I would have the relapses and I really relied on people like we talked about before. That was definitely draining for me. And like a bit, yeah, I felt like a bit annoying sometimes or just like people didn't understand and also exhausting. Like that's what I just think of out of that whole situation. I'm like, Oh, that was exhausting. Trying to always ask for like arrange people. For an example, like when I was in school, I had friends who would drive me from like building to building on the campus so that I could avoid walking for those periods. Cause any extra weight on my legs would cause a flare up. And so, and I would often skip class actually, and just go home like do half a day and then go home or whatever it would be. But I just like the thought that comes up is like, wow, that was very vulnerable, but also exhausting, just relying on everyone. And, and also like, for, for me, I think a lot of it too was like, I was trying to get better. Now I'm at the point where I'm a lot better, but like, oh, I, I can do this. I can do this. And I would revert back into my old self when I wasn't injured. And I still do this now. I've, I'm a lot better now, but like thinking mentally, oh, I can do it. And then I did something that I'd be like, oh, I should have asked for help because I can't do this anymore the way that I used to and being frustrated. 
and then being like, okay, when I need this thing, I'll just ask for help. And then a month or something goes by and then I'm like, oh, I'm feeling pretty good today. Do it again. Then I have a relapse, flare up in bed, whatever. And then I'm like, why did I do that? That's so annoying. So frustrating. I know I have these people who can help me. And then a month goes by again. <laughs> and it's just, it was like this habit. And I think that was part, like a big fighting the independence thing of like, I think there's a balance because especially when you're in a rehab that has to do with insurance, which is what mine was, they want you to gain that independence. They want you to, to see what you're capable of. They want to push you to your fullest potential essentially. So it's like balancing all these things of like, okay, am I being stubborn? Probably a little bit. Am I trying my best? Yes. Am I doing what they asked me to? Yes. Am I in pain? Yes. Did I make it worse? <laughs> Yes. But does my mental state feel better because I tried? Probably yes. So it's like, for me, it was always juggling all those things. Like if I don't do this, physically I might be better, but then mentally, am I going to feel defeated? Cause I didn't try uh, cause I'm too scared to allow myself to see if there, if, if I can still do it. So I don't, yeah, it was a very frustrating, confusing time. What is something you want to do, but you can't do anymore? I would love to be able to go hiking or like do a, an intense dance class or point, go to the gym and like really, like really work out hard. Now I can do yoga and Pilates, like kind of what I describe as they're really intense. They can be intense, but it's not weight bearing. But like, I would love to go like hiking for eight hours, for an example, and camp or just adventure around or even simple mm -hmm. things like the winter for me, the temperature, that's a really big factor for my pain. Um, it gets significantly worse when it's cold. Mm -hmm. So even being able to wake up and not have to think like, okay, I'm going to do this, this, and this so that I'm not at like in so much agony and pain, then I'm going to go to work, survive, come home, have a nap, take this, this, and this, then go back to work and kind of scheduling like all these little things around. I'm sure you experience this as well, but sometimes I just think like, wow, if I didn't have to do so much self-care, mm -hmm. like I would be, I would have so much time. <laughs> of course. I don't know why, but like when you mentioned yoga, for some reason, I did, I did like imagine like you wanting to do like goat yoga. Ghost yoga? What's ghost yoga? Go, goat, goat. Oh, goat yoga. And like the hot yoga. For some reason, I did imagine you like wanting to do those things. Yeah, I haven't actually tried hot yoga, but I know it's really beneficial. Like I'm sure it would help my body um, because it releases so many toxins and things like that. But yeah, I think, and also the like, I think it would be amazing to wake up one day and just be like, not have to, not have to like map out, okay, I'm gonna, I need to go shopping. So that means I'm gonna be on my feet for X amount of time, which means I need to sit for this amount of time. Like just having a day where it's just like, I can just do whatever and my body's not gonna hate me the next day. <laughs> but that's just not a freedom I have anymore. And that's, that's okay. So it seems like you're kind of like on a schedule or more of you plan things out ahead of time so you don't run into like a roadblock or you avoid a situation that you don't want to be in. I, I mean, I like to be spontaneous, but yeah, I do my best to have some sort of schedule. Um, for an example, in the winter for me, even in the summer, but definitely in the winter, like I mentioned, my pain level is significantly higher. And something that helps with that the most is actually like rest, like sleeping and having rest. And so I'm lucky enough that with my schedule and the age of my kids and stuff, I have a break, uh, a break in the day, midday, and I always will come home and have a nap. And that helps my pain level so much um, for whatever reason, like that has been a massive thing, just being able to rest partway through my shift. I actually work full time, but when I first left uh, and like was done with rehab, I think they said I would work like, I think it was something like eight hours a day in a quiet office, very low stress type situation. But because of how flexible my boss is with my schedule, um, like there's obviously certain things I need to be there for at work, but 
I was able to create the schedule where I can come home and rest for a few hours and then go back to work which I think is the only way I could actually work full time in this position anyways. Yeah, so you mentioned like earlier that you love to dance and such and you can't do that anymore. And you mm-hmm. also love to hike and like be spontaneous. So like now it's like what makes you happy now? I love meeting new people actually and just like talking to people. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I love doing that. I, I really enjoy yoga like I mentioned before. I enjoy hanging out with people. Like I can still go for walks. So I go for walks with people. Um, I can still do, there's some classes online of dance classes that sometimes I'll modify and I'll do it sitting down Um, or I'll try to just pace myself really well. I really enjoy Pilates as well. And again, I just like modify it to what I can do. So those are probably the main things still health focused. But I think like my biggest passion is always, it's like just connecting with people. I mean, that's really why I post things on Instagram because I felt very alone in that experience. And one, I didn't want, I was hopeful that it could help someone else if they were feeling down or they could relate in any way. But also I was kind of like, well, people probably aren't going to share with me unless I share first. Um, so, you seem to have a very vulnerable. Uh, hey, what Sorry about type that. of dog do you have? A little miniature dachshund. Cute. And he's barking at a wall for some reason. <laughs> um. Yeah, so I want to. You gonna stop talking, Chloe? You know. I'm... Just wants <laughs> to be part of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like she literally did looking at a wall, so I have no idea. But I think she's okay. Um, yeah, so I wanted to say that you have a very vulnerable audience. That like you, for everyone that's listening, she posted um, like a question of like, what is your feelings about crying? And you got a ton of responses, like 20 mm-hmm. plus. So it seems like you have a very vulnerable audience that's willing to share that, even though it's anonymous to everyone else but still like i'm still trying to get to that a non to do that vulnerable stage because like i have a crying video on myself and when i made that video i was not expecting me to cry because in my lifetime i cried maybe like less than 10 times Mm. so it's like a very um um i don't know if it was like an eye-opening experience because i never did that before and then to have it on actual camera, like mm-hmm. I would not expect, I would not even planning to cry at all or anything. I can just like cry on command, which would be a very good skill. And if I was acting, but yeah, so it was just very like vulnerable. And then the other part of it was, do I want to post it? Because like I didn't want first, I didn't want to seem like I was weak and vulnerable and like you know, like I like my profile to be like fun and funny and like outgoing and stuff now and then also like do people really want to see a person crying too Mm -hmm. so like i sat on the video for like a well i put on youtube because more i feel more anonymous on youtube because i don't have to share with anyone Mm -hmm. but it took me like six months to put it on instagram for like my friends to see Mm -hmm. and I mean, the feedback was great, but it was just a very vulnerable experience. And I don't know, I still, like, like when I was reading all your answers, I seemed crying is way more popular, I guess. It did not talked about a lot. Well, I'm really proud of you for sharing that on your Instagram and with your friends and stuff. That's definitely not an easy thing to do. So I think you should be proud of yourself for that. And yeah, allow yourself to cry in the moment. Yeah, it was just real. Like, I don't know. It's like, I'm just not a very emotional person. And mm-hmm. like all my life, I always had to be like the strong person. Mm-hmm. And so, so like, I don't know what, maybe it's the people I'm surrounded with more. Like I'm starting my advocacy, my whole advocacy, like six months to a year now. So now I'm being more surrounded by people who are, more open, open and willing to share all this like deep secrets that I just never I always had but I just never shared it and it's like now I'm meeting like 
you when you just like talk about it, like, oh, like I cried today, and it's like someone else is like, oh, I ate pizza, you know, you're just so like, hey, I cried today, like, okay, like, well, like, what do you have for dinner, you know? It's like, so, so it's like cool to meet you and other people. It's like, hey, you're just so open with your emotions, and it's like, you know, like, yeah, we all have our dark moments, but it's kind of like normal. And then for me, it's also harder because we have a have a much deeper trauma. Mm-hmm. And like, I can only relate to a s- smaller population. So it's even harder to find someone that's vulnerable. And so it's like awesome to meet like people like you. And like, it's like so all open and like, like you've been through so much traumatic stuff, but like you came out on the other side. So like positive and warm and not like hateful. And yeah. like sometimes I just see people who are just like, they can't seem to get out of the rough. And it's yeah. like, and it's like hard to help someone. When did you get the strength to start like sharing your story in like a positive light? I gave myself, I think it's only been like really intentional for, I want to say six months or something. I did share before on my Instagram, but it wasn't as constant. It wasn't really like a niche, I guess. It wasn't as intentional as, as regular. Um, And I kind of, I had it in the back of mind of like, oh, I want, I know I need to talk about this. Like, I know there's people who I can connect with because I was the same. I was like, I want to meet people who get it. I don't want to have to fake. I don't want to have to kind of like walk on eggshells. I don't want to have to be someone I'm not. I really value authenticity and honesty. And I, I felt like sometimes I wasn't being that with the people that were in my life at the, at the time, because they, not because of anything they've done wrong or anything but they just didn't experience anything remotely the same and so there wasn't that connection there so yeah I really intentionally started posting about my experience about six months ago I would say but even before that it was tricky because I was in school and like I mentioned like a lot of people witnessed the accident and they kind of knew about my journey but it was also so exhausting because the where the accident took place and where my school was is very close there I mean I from where the accident happened to the front entrance of where my school is is probably like a three minute walk at the most maybe two minutes so it's very much was in the same location so during the time when I was in school and in rehab I was just trying to survive because I was very triggered I was unaware of how damaging it would be to be in the same environment or around close enough to the same environment that the accident took place in. And that took a huge toll on my mental health. But then also to be around everybody, like uh, not exaggerating every few minutes, Danny, how are you doing? What's wrong with you? What did they say? Why are you still on crutches? Why is this happening? You know, like all these questions, when will you better be better? Why aren't you better yet? Oh, maybe you you should do this. So like really intense because like I said, same location, tons of people witnessed the accident. And then at the time I was also going to a Bible school. It was like an art school, leadership and Bible school all combined into one, which was also another very confronting, tricky thing to navigate because I think with anyone, but specifically when you're in a religious or for me, when I was in a religious school, Bible school, it was very confronting because people think like, oh, well, if this, if I believe in God and I think God is good, then why would something happen that's so bad to this one person who's here? So it was like, I think I represented a lot of like confusion, confrontation, so many questions that are just to do with beliefs as general human, like humanity. Why do we exist? Those big questions. <laughs> that I think a lot of people thought they knew until they saw my situation and then was like, Oh, kind of (laughs) freaked out and was like, do I believe this? Do I really believe, you know, that I believe in what I've said in the past because it doesn't line up with what I'm seeing now. So I need to fix it. So clearly there's something, she must've done something to either deserve to be hit or something in their family went wrong. Like lots of people would come up with all these like crazy reasons why the accident happened. And at first, like, of course, it took a mental toll. Of course, it was really harmful and damaging. But after I gave my, 
myself space away from it. I was like, this has nothing to do with me. Like that is clearly a you issue that you need to figure out why (laughs) my presence of not being quote unquote healed or fully better or whatever you want to like put that label on. If that's really confronting for you, I think that there's some internal work that's needing to be done. Um, so it brought up some really intense things for a lot of people. And I don't even remember what your question was, but navigating <laughs> that was very, it was a slippery slope. <laughs> uh, so are you religious? So I'm assuming you were religious before. So are you religious yes. now? I would say that I am, I still believe in God. I'm very open though. I, I still would identify as being Christian, but I don't. I don't support a lot of things that happen within church and a lot of beliefs that people take on from reading the Bible. Um, Yeah, there's tons of different things that I don't agree with, but definitely a lot. I experience this and I don't know if you have experienced this as well, just in public, like if people have ever come up to you and just been like, I'm going to pray for you right now. And you're like, whoa. Uh, one, I don't want to be prayed for. Two, I don't think I need prayer for anything. And three, don't touch me. <laughs> <laughs> like, and so, anyways, yeah, I would say I still believe in God, but um, there's like a lot of things within church that I just have no or no or z- like very little tolerance for I'm very fast to be like nope that's wrong I don't believe in that I don't like that and so I'm not going to attend if I don't I was in um you know I'm Catholic school all my life and then I turned out to be an atheist Mm -hmm. so it's funny how that all just turned out just like I don't like I don't I think the bible is like a horror it's like a horrible book in itself Mm -hmm. and like if you talk to any religious person they'll like twist anything to fit their logic and mm-hmm. it's just so confusing and so it takes so much mental gymnastics to explain anything and then i'm just like what like do you know what you're saying at times <laughs> yeah i found yeah i just had to have a lot of grace for people and trying to understand that in their perspective they're trying to do the right thing. They're probably trying to be helpful, even though they're, for me, that's a really big trigger. If someone comes up to me and starts praying for me and starts trying to tr- like treat me like I need to be fixed, that I'm not a whole person and that I need to, there's something wrong with me and they can't accept who I am now. That for me is like, I get angry and very like, you have no right to, <laughs> to do that. And it's very triggering. But then I also try like whenever I get heated, then I try to remember like people are just trying to do their best. They're doing what they were trained, trained to do or raised to do or believe that's the right thing, whether it is or not. And either I can be extremely upset about it, which is valid. And I give myself space to have those feelings, but also going back and remembering, okay, you know, but to be honest, before the accident, I never really thought about it that much. Like what it would, I never really, I knew church could be traumatizing. I knew religious situations or beliefs and stuff could be traumatizing. And from one perspective, I'm like, yep, that makes sense. But then it's just different when you experience it, of course, then it's like, oh, this is like a, this is a whole different thing I didn't even picture. And there's so much hurt that can come with those words and those actions and beliefs and all that stuff. But yeah, I think I always just need to give people grace and like, okay, you know what? Part of it is your fault because you are choosing to keep these beliefs and keep behaving this way. But on the other time, other end, you maybe never had the space that was safe to explore other options or other thoughts, or maybe you're so scared to explore other alternatives that what you're doing is harmful, but you don't see why that's harmful. If that makes sense. Like and, I'm just a and, big person about grace. I try yeah. anyways. But you want to hear a bold take? Yeah. So so your religious people actually love well the the leaders of religious groups actually love atheists and people that don't like religion because 
when these religious people will come, like let's say to you and you and you don't like them and they're like mean to you, you know what they do? They go back to the religious groups and they say how bad of an experience it is. And then they continue to stay in that group because it's comforting and warm. And mm-hmm. then that's how that's how cults are formed because they're in like a safe place and everyone around them is evil. So they mm-hmm. keep staying in that place and then they never leave. And then and they make it very hard to leave because they like control your lives and everything. And mm-hmm. it's like ingrained into you. And it's like hard to like, like when I was in private school, you know, it's like I would pound it with religion for, I don't know, like 15 years. And then it's mm-hmm. like, I was able to break out. I was just like, I, like I went through my traumatic experiences and like I self-reflected on religion a lot because I don't know about you, but like to me, what well, like, I couldn't blame anyone or anything really for my health. Mm. Like my, I have a rare disease and that was just, oh, just a random occurrence. So it's like, huh. So like everyone thinks God is good. And I'm like, okay, like, okay, let, let's agree with that statement. But it's like, and why there's so much suffering in the world and why are all these people being hurt for no reason? Like, I'm just, like, there are all these bad people and nothing bad happens to them and like I'm assuming you're a good person you didn't do anything that bad before you mm-hmm. don't deserve any of this at all and it's like why are these people getting hurt like why it's like and everyone's like God is good and he has a plan and it's like huh it's like why would God want to make your life miserable like he created the heavens and the earth and mm-hmm. it's like wouldn't he want you to enjoy it to the most of, to the most of it and like you know babies are being born and you can't live past the age of one it's like wouldn't you want them to enjoy life for a hundred years instead of mm-hmm. just living and then going to heaven it's like huh and then but like you can't fight logic with these religious breaks at this point and it's like not worth it but mm-hmm. i think like when i would in my traumatic lonely times you self reflected a lot and like I grew a lot as a person but at the same time I feel so like I mentioned like the first thing we said was like I went through such a traumatic experience that a lot of people wouldn't be in the same situation like I mm-hmm. think we're similar in that sense that we have a lot of self-reflection and a lot of like we were really low in our lives that most people won't be able ever be able to be at but we're also way better than I think a lot of people in terms of like self-esteem and and being secure in ourselves like Mm -hmm. now look now look at you like you're posting your story almost every day and like you're talking about crying but if you ask an average person on the street hey what do you think about crying they would like look at you like what (laughs) so I think it's like we had very shitty experiences but we came out so much stronger and more self-secure in ourselves. And now, like, mm-hmm. we can just talk about crying. It's like, like, what what makes you, like, what makes you, like, stop crying, like, now? Like, what brings you out of, like, a dark place now? Usually when I cry, I mean, sometimes I cry when I'm actually happy as well. Or if I'm just moved, it doesn't have to be a sadness. Like, I have many different cries um like but there is like the deep mourning sadness anger kind of emotions and then there's happy or just like very touched but usually for me it's just like a general release like I'm just I I allow myself to get really frustrated and upset and angry that this happened to me and then once it's released and I take a day or whatever that might look like and I release it and I cry and I might write something about it or I might just sit in it or I might just have a few days where I'm really down and I feel really depressed, but I just let myself feel that. And then whenever I give my body space to do that, it always will go away. It's when I won't allow myself to feel those feelings. That's when I would be concerned for myself. If I didn't give myself space to feel those things and feel really depressed I feel the PTSD and anxiety and my fears. And if I didn't allow myself to express them, that's when it would be, I would be concerned for myself because at that point it wouldn't be, oh, you're down for three days. That would be like, she's down and she's down in a very dark, dark place. 
Mm -hmm. So for me, it's not really anything that I mentally cognitively am like, okay, I'm going to let myself cry for X amount of time. And then I'm going to go eat pizza and that will make me happy. It's more just like, okay, I can tell my body needs to cry. I'm upset. I don't know why. And then I'll be in pain or whatever. And then I'm like, yep, this sucks. I don't know why this happened to me. I'm angry. Why did this only happen to me? Why, you know, go down the spiral. And then eventually once all those like big questions of anger and like, even like I went through a period where I also was like, Oh, maybe I don't believe in God anymore. Maybe I don't believe in like, in any, any form of deity at all. And being frustrated in that and being like, maybe I've been living a lie. Maybe all my beliefs are trash. <laughs> maybe I, <laughs> you know, all these different things. But it's always, ever, always been, if I let myself explore them, whether it's questions about theology and religion, about like the human experience, about emotions, about whatever, if I allow myself to experience them, I know I'm going to be okay and I'm going to come out of it. Yeah, so it seems like you don't, so if you're having like a darker moment, you just let everything come through you and you just like deal with it and you don't plan, you don't plan to end it. You kind of let the body ride the course and then you just, you just know that you'll be okay at the end of the, Mm -hmm. let's say, small journey. I think it's Um, like what you said about the security, like having a security in yourself because Mm -hmm. we've both experienced things that are very traumatic and we've both been in such a dark place. I'm like, I know in my core, even mentally, if I'm like, don't trust myself within myself, everything in me is like, no, you can do this. Like you got this. And you know, like for me, it might be like, everyone's different, but my body, like I can tell if something's wrong based on my body. And I think that maybe comes to, and with dance too, like being very in touch with how I'm feeling, my body, how I'm reacting to things. Like if my stomach's hurting, I'm like, oh, I'm anxious, like different things. Like I'm quite in tune with different parts of my body. So yeah, just giving that space, like you said, like trusting yourself, like even if mentally I'm going, like can't tell myself why I'm allowing myself to go dark there, like that dark inside that core where you fought before. It's just like, yep, we can do this. And I, ever- I wonder if you have that as well. Yeah, are you ever just like in a situation where you're just like, this is like work, you know, I've been through so much terrible shit and this is like nothing. This is like a... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's always like, uh, well, it could be worse, couldn't it? Like in my head, which, I mean, I don't say that to other people because that's that can be extremely damaging and ignore mm-hmm. the whole, yeah, you know, their whole experience. But for myself, when sometimes I'm like, because sometimes I have days, everyone has days when it's like, it's the smallest thing. And it's like, I'm going to explode. This is, <laughs> everything's just a disaster. This is the worst day. I'm in pain and whatever. And then, like, and then, and then I'll like cool down or whatever, or and then my like husband might later, start laughing. And yeah, then, and then yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, a day later, yeah. just like laughing, like, it's so stupid. Like, why did I cry over? I don't know. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, like, do you um so do you, so you get emotional watching movies then? A hundred percent. So like, what was the last movie? <laughs> um, I if it's a good movie, yeah, I'll get like really into it. I won't cry, but like, like you know, like the before the crying, where your face kind of like in a crying stay. Mm-hmm. Like, I start to do that if I get really deep into it. So, like, mm-hmm. what was the last movie you cried in? Okay, I can't think of the movie offhand, but I've been watching The Fosters, and that, have you seen that show? No. So it's a couple, it's a couple who um, is always pretty much taking in foster kids, and they end up, in the end, they end up adopting four kids, not all at the same time, but like spontaneously, and it's all about their life, and the kids' life before they were in foster care, during foster care, and then after, in the process of them being adopted, and then how they're doing life, how they integrate their family. And that always, every episode, it just, I might not be bawling, but I definitely get teary eyed or will have a few tears. <laughs> and I just think it's be, like, I love family. I come from a really big family. 
And there's just, I love hosting people. Like there's something about just being a safe, a safe place that I find that very attractive and, and yeah, providing homes for people who don't have homes. I, it just hits something in me. It just always, it just makes me emotional. And then anything too with dogs as well, (laughs) that will make me cry. Any puppies. That I'll probably cry at that too. No, I can't watch any movie. I had like a puppy in the in the um, poster because you just know that puppy is gonna die. Yeah, no, like oh, what is that show? I can't even remember right now. But maybe it's Buddy. I can't remember. No, it's not Buddy. Anyways, it's a, a show about a dog, and I remember like every single time whenever I see it, just gets you every time. You know it's coming. No, it I doesn't can't. matter. That's the thing. It doesn't matter. I could watch the same thing, like the show The Holiday. I could watch it endless times. I always know what's going to happen because I've seen it. But something inside of you still is hopeful that it's not going to end the way that it always ends. (laughs) And then you're just devastated. It's also weird, too. I don't know why, but like, we could watch like a hundred people get like murdered and we're like, okay. But one dog died, you know, we did lose control. Mm -hmm. Like, like, have you seen the movie I Am Legend? Yeah. You know, like, you know, like the movie with like everyone dead and they talk like, horrible and it's like, okay, like this is cool. And then the dog died and then you're just like, no, not mm-hmm. the dog. Like, you're so cool. And then it's like, I don't know. I don't know where like that emotional or like, like there'll be all these like dog commercials. Like, oh, I'm still need this kind of money to like help a sick puppy. And then like, mm-hmm. and then if you see like Bossy children, you're just like, um, that's nice. Mm -hmm. it's like i don't know it's like a weird connection of like why we are more emotional towards animals versus humans like i don't know i don't know if that's like a fault in our dna yeah i'm not sure i do think that it has a lot to do with like the majority of the time people are the ones that hurt you animals are not Typically animals are very like therapeutic and help you out of those dark places. And a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of people are kind of what put you in those dark places as simple as like a car never, and uh, a dog never drove a car to hit me. A person did that. So uh, that's a very valid that point. So do you have any pets? I don't. I used to in our apartment that me and my husband live in now, we're not allowed pets, but my parents just adopted a puppy no. that we helped take care of. <laughs> so and her name's Shayla she's very cute so I would love to have a dog I had a little chihuahua well he was like a mid sized chihuahua growing up and in hindsight now I'm like that was he was my therapy dog like he definitely calmed me down kept me centered without me being like aware of, of it so once we were, have access to being able to have a dog we will get one for yeah. therapy purposes really fast is that do you find that as well? Like uh, your dog therapeutic? It's, I mean, I love my dog with all my heart. I probably love her more than anything. And I did like the kids that she gives me. Like, like I'll like go out for like a lunch or something and I'll be like, I miss my dog. Mm-hmm. Or even like if she's in the other room, I'll be like, oh, I miss, like her name's Chloe. So I'll be like, I miss Chloe. Or I'll just like mm-hmm. say her name out loud because I was the one that named her and I did love the name and Mm-hmm. They love the attention, but it's hard to say if she really helped me, though. I mean, she was always there. But for me, that helped me mostly. I don't really know what helped me get out of the rough part because, like, my family were not very um, emotionally supportive of me. Mm-hmm. I took care of other things, which I'm grateful for. So I'm not really sure what made me become the person who I am because, like, Third kid, you had like a lot of really good friends, and like they came and like supported you, and that's like I'm like so jealous of that. And it's like when I was going through my traumatic moment, I really didn't have anyone. Mm. Like no one really like I I only had like one friend every show, and two years now she's my best friend, mm. and I'm forever grateful for it. But like no one really like hit me up at all to like check on me or anything. You know, like, some people, like, commented on stuff, but, like, they didn't, like, check up on me or anything. It was, like, I wanted to be vulnerable, but at the same time, like, no one cared. And it's so it was, like, deflating in the moment. Because, like, 
a lot of people will say like, oh, if you're vulnerable and you meet vulnerable people and they'll be vulnerable with you. And it's like, I didn't have that experience. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, is there something wrong with me? Is it like a, a, a sex thing? Is it like, are women able to be more emotional and people will rush to that and like, can men be or not? And yeah, so this like really conflicted of like what to do. Like, do I keep advocating do i just stop and like that's it to keep my emotion to myself because like no one cared and then at one point i was just like i don't really care anymore i'm just gonna be authentic to myself and it is how i feel mm -hmm. i'm gonna keep doing it and then eventually i started finding you know a group of people and like a tribe and they were sharing stuff and i was like okay this is like my people now and then now now I'm doing a podcast, I'm talking to you, and it's like, you're vulnerable, and it's like, awesome to talk about this so openly, and I don't have, like, no backlash or anything like that. It's just cool to be open and not worry about if you're going to judge me or not. Mm -hmm. So that's just really an awesome feeling. Well, I'm sorry to hear that you never felt supported in those moments, or, like, anybody cared. That must have been very challenging. I can't imagine. Because I think yeah, they I mean, really... They, I yeah, everyone my... did drop the ball. And it's just like, it is horrible. It's like, like I was like going through suicide and stuff. And it's like, like did anyone even care at all? And it's just like, so what the F? And it's like, but I don't know. It, I think the biggest thing that like you mentioned it before was like, like hope in a way. Like things will get better, like how to put myself together. And now I'm like, I'm like so secure in myself now that like, you know, like I'm sure you're the same way. Like if you're like being friends with someone, they're not treating you well or whatever. I just like drop them on the way then. <laughs> yeah. Like, I haven't been like, you know, like I'm a good person. Like if you're not going to want me for me, like, okay, that's fine. I'm secure mm -hmm. myself. You know, it's your loss, not mine. Totally. Like, yeah, so now I'm just like this lone ranger and it's like, hey, if people want to join my journey and be with me, awesome. If you don't, that's fine. Like, I'm like, I don't need you, but I, I wanted you to be in my life, but I don't need you. Mm -hmm. I have myself and like, that's kind of all I need. But totally. still, yeah, still like a somewhat lonely journey, though. Like, I wish mm -hmm. I had more people to like be friendly with and like, like if I'm going through a tough time, like, hey, to like, to be like out of that awkward talking stage in a way, mm -hmm. like, hey, like, just be a little more open or like, you know, like if I call someone and like, hey, I'll call you back in 20 minutes, but like people just ghost me and I'm just like, cool. And then like, they'll like contact me and like, hey, I need help. And I'll be like, hey, no, you know, I can't do this. You know, it's like not fair for mm -hmm. me to be supportive and stuff. And it's like, you weren't, it's like, you know, like, I want to be a good person, but, like, you got to, like, put your boundaries up. Man. Well, I hope that um, you do find some people close by that are more supportive or online as well. I will say, hopefully, it's an encouragement that while I had really good friends, I also had some that were trash <laughs> at the same <laughs> time and that they naturally faded or died or they became Dead. a different a different level of friendship like not as close so i had really amazing friends and presently do but i hope it's encouraging to you that i also have had friends that i thought were my best friend who, who ended up being really harmful and hurtful or one of my best friends at the time and now we don't talk at all we're not in each other's lives at all so i hope that's some sort of encouragement that you know, there's there everyone I think in this circumstance goes through hard times of like finding the right people. I do think I lucked out pretty hard, um, but hopefully it's encouragement that um, that there's someone, some a group of people out there for you too. They're not, they're not. Yeah, where are you guys? <laughs> Come find me. Uh, yeah, yes. and the more you put yourself out there, like on this podcast, for an example, and just asking people to be on it. Um, by default, you're going to meet people who hopefully kind of connect on the same level. That's what I hope for you. I, I mean, I hope they're not too honest. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, yeah, so before I say the mic away, do you, is there anything you'd like to say or promote or any closing uh, thoughts? Well, I just appreciate you having me on here and that you that this exists. I think that's awesome. I am happy that you found me on Instagram and then we connected that way and have been able to connect a little bit. And I guess if anyone wants to find me on Instagram, um, join a support group or be connected. My name on there is Danny Zach and I would love to connect with you and have a chat and hopefully help you um, meet some other people who are in the Spoonie community. Yeah, like I mentioned in the beginning, that she had a very warm profile on that. I think you'll love, and I'll definitely put all her information below. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.